we do are, are under a little bit of time constraint so it makes it a little bit uh, more difficult to go into a lot of detail I was uh, looking for pictures to stick in here for the uh, anatomy of an SBC and this was the least anatomically correct one I could find the um, Tony's gone over a lot of, I think, some of the basics, you know. I think kind of the key thing is what's the applications that you're trying to provide your customers. That will drive a lot of your decisions as to say, where does the um, SBC fit in the network? What's the uh, capacity requirements? What are the services that you're trying to provide? But I correct that almost all VoIP networks have some type of SBC. From the key decision, I think, is, is really the control of the session and what type of policies you're trying to apply for that that particular customer and I, I tend to take an evolutionary pr perspective on things in that um, the, in the IMS world it IMS would be a really great great solution if there wasn't a bunch of VoIP networks already deployed today and so I think it, it's going to take you know the I guess what's the joke about how did God create the world in six days well there wasn't an installed base so we really have this ROI component that there's networks out there making money, making a lot of money for their, their um, carriers, and now we have this new architecture coming in that really requires a, a very different approach, and sure, maybe a lot of um, benefits in the long run for that um, architecture, but it will take a lot of time to get there, and in the meantime, it has to be cost justified as a transition. And so um, that's a larger topic than we're really here to discuss, but these are pretty much the same common um, functions that were described before. Convergence uh, is interworking basically like protocols, and that's com commonly called protocol normalization, but um, it's actually uh, required to be sort of an intelligent proxy or a B2B UA is, is kind of what comes in from that perspective. If I looked at kind of the uh, basic applications, you have a retail service, and most of you, I think, are probably in this regards. It's the more complex application, so it's worth spending some time to look at. But from from a customer perspective, you'll have a customer network that might have uh, just user agents, SIP phones or soft clients or mobile phones accessing through to your Class 5 feature servers. And you may have IP PBXs running SIP trunks from call managers or Avaya systems. And you're trying to access those, provide access to those um, customers into your feature servers. And that's where your policy um, decisions are going to be made and your um, higher level applications. It, it's worthwhile to remember that in the TDM days, if any of us are, <laughs> go back that far, you had a class 5 TDM switch and then you had class 4 switches. And this architecture, and then actually the class fours would, would switch calls between the class fives. And when you needed to go internationally, go up to even a class three switch. And that hierarchy allowed a very inefficient TDM switching network to be, you know, globally deployed. And it actually makes sense in the, in the VoIP world as well, in that if you have class five feature servers on a, on a very large scale, you're going to have some in LA, you're going to have some in all your different towns, well, you don't need to do all the um, peering at those particular class 5 switches, so the feature servers. So it makes sense to send the calls up to a class 4 switch, which in, in, in a lot of our deployments anyway is the peering portion of the SBC. So we're not only interconnecting the peering aspect of things, but we're interconnecting the class 5 services, the feature servers, so they don't have to worry about routing between themselves. If it's not, if the call is not for one of their subscribers, they just send it upstream and they don't have to worry about the uh, uh, route tables. But um, certainly from a, anatomy of an SBC, the, the um, HA is a, is a key thing for high availability. It's, I think, uh, no, as uh, Gary was saying, nobody expects five nines. But on the other hand, I don't think anybody will buy an SBC that doesn't have HA, okay? If you can't maintain a call during a failover, you don't even get uh, in the door in most places. In the peering um, application, I think this is sort of a subset, but there's a little bit different uh, requirements, I think, from the peering side um, in that they, they tend to be 
uh, slightly different on the, um, for, for instance, on the Access SBC, your DDoS is uh, essentially made from um, a whitelist, I'm sorry, a blacklist, which means you, ha you have to accept traffic in from everybody. On a peering SBC, you already know in advance what your termination points are. You have IP addresses and FQDNs, and that, that's your peering point. You don't have to even listen to anybody else. So that, that's basically a whitelist. As you configure a, um, an endpoint, you now have created access through your DDoS protection for that device. Um, on the access side, you're listening to subscribers coming in from all over, and then you apply, okay, this person's uh, giving me trouble, I'm going to blacklist them. So there's two different types of DDoS mechanisms, but in any event, you still have to apply call admission control characteristics for those. Wow, we do have to go fast. So let me skip ahead um, from uh, uh, other features that come in on the retail type of applications where you have proxy asserted identities now. PAIs are required by most carriers. So your, your um, access SBC may need to apply PAI parameters to your SIP trunking applications. Uh, dynamic trunks is another common thing in, in the SIP trunking world where the, care, the customer's IP addresses keep changing every month and so your, your SBC has to learn that and simply you know, make that all transparent to your um, feature servers. Uh, CNAM is another one where if you're using a SIP trunking application you want to go out and do a CNAM dip before you send that call to the uh, um, customer transcoding because oftentimes you have a lower bit rate application or lower bit rate circuit out to that IP PBX. On the wholesale side, you still have the PAI. Um, it gets generated in a different context because now, now it might be your PAI going out to the carrier. LNP lookups are, are really um, becoming more and more critical to the wholesale applications where I don't want to route on the DNS. I want to go do an LNP dip, find out where I'm really supposed to route the call. Enum is another great example of, of how you can lower your termination cost and also pr potentially improve your quality of uh, termination in that Enum may be a better quality uh, termination route than going out to your traditional TDM. Um, Any DNS relationship for toll calls. This is our quote unquote anatomy and um, uh, essentially our, our approach is to build in these applications and then uh, selectively allow customers to configure them out. If they don't need them, they don't, they don't have to use them. You can make it very streamlined. Um, that kind of conflicts a little bit with the IMS model, which is de-aggregate it and, and um, really make very, very specific parts in each device. But we think in the software we can make that happen. It's more or less customizing how you build your uh, perfect configuration. How you'd build it is really based upon your customers um, requirements and how you feel your your com company can uh, deal with the complexities of the controls required for the sessions.